Well, if you're watching me on screen, you know by now that I'm not with you, obviously. Um, and you have probably heard that uh, I have sick with a cold, which I have decided not to inflict upon you, doing what we encourage everyone to do, to stay home if you're sick. So uh, today we are in the final chapter of James, James chapter 5. And here in this last chapter of his letter to Christians everywhere, James speaks about six topics. The power and the peril of wealth, patience, judgment, prayer, Christian community, balancing dis discipline with mercy. As with the rest of his letter, James has some incredible wisdom to share on all of these topics. Wisdom that if we learn and apply it, can help us to be better people and better Christians. I encourage you to prayerfully and carefully read the whole chapter and ask God to help you apply it to your lives. Today, we're going to spend most of our time on what James says about prayer, because it's such a key and foundational part of our lives as Christians. But first, let's read chapter five. And today I'm going to use the, I'm going to read from the message translation, because of all the translations I read this chapter, and this gives me the best image of what James is actually saying, and I hope it does the same for you. So let's read from James chapter 5. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to read along with me. And a final word to you among, uh, amongst you arrogant rich. Take some lessons in lament. You'll need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you've piled up is judgment. All the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master of injure. You've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you've done is, is condemn and murder perfectly good people who stand there and take it. Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see, farmers do this all the time, waiting for the valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. The master could arrive at any time. Friends, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint can be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing just around the corner. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit, all the time honouring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. And that's because God cares, cares right down to the last detail. And since you know that he cares, let your language show it. Don't add words like, I swear to God, to your own words. Don't show your impatience by concocting oaths to hurry up God. Just say yes or no. Just say what is true. That way, your language can't be used against you. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the Master. Believing prayer will heal you, and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human just like us, prayed hard that it 
wouldn't rain, and it didn't. It was dropped for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. The showers came and everything started growing again. My dear friends, friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back. And you have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. Now, before we talk about prayer, a few words on the other subjects that James talks about. Wealth and money. He starts by focusing on the wealthy, the rich, or more precisely, on how they've used their money. Now, we might be tempted to brush over this, to brush over these verses. After all, we aren't rich, are we? But is that true? If we compare ourselves to Bill Gates or Donald Trump, we certainly aren't rich. Well, certainly not rich like them. But what if we compare ourselves to the homeless and those begging for food around us? James is not saying that having money, that being wealthy is a bad thing. But like Jesus, he is saying that the love of money is what causes us to ignore the needs of others, to not act to help others, and so to bring God's judgment on us. James calls us to open our eyes to God and his word and to prayerfully consider how best to use our money, no matter if we have a little or if we have a lot. Patience. No matter whether you believe it is because of our actions as human beings, or whether you believe it, it is just part of the natural cycle of this planet Earth on which we live, it's pretty clear that the climate is changing. Just this week, we've seen massive flooding in Pakistan, where over a thousand people have died from one of the worst monsoon seasons in history. One of CNN's headlines captures the devastation. A third of Pakistan is underwater amid its worst floods in history. At the same time, The Guardian carried this headline. Historic monuments resurface as severe drought shrinks Spain's reservoirs. It goes on to say that the climate crisis has left parts of Spain at their driest in more than 1,000 years. Less than 8,500 kilometers apart, a distance Google tells me you could drive in just under four days, we see the worst flooding and the worst drought in centuries. I find myself wondering, are these the signs that Jesus is returning soon? The sign Jesus spoke about in Luke 21, verse 11. There will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands. And there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. And in verse 25, and there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. Maybe they are, and maybe they aren't. James's word to us is to be patient, because he wants us to wait for Jesus' coming. And he reminds us of Job and the prophets to encourage us that, we see, that what we see as a difficulty, a trial and trouble, God can and does use for his purposes and our spiritual growth. Challenges and difficulties are part of life. Like steel being formed from iron, heated until it is molten, the best thing we can do is allow God to use everything we go through to strengthen us and make us better followers of Christ. Judging others. Chairs covered this last week, so there's no more to say here, really, rather than just to remind ourselves of Jesus' teaching in Luke 6, verse 37, which James no doubt has in mind. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, 
it will, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Christian community. Again, James's words are quite clear. He reminds us that Christians everywhere have a responsibility to and for each other as the local body of Christ. We are interconnected and we are to care for each other, to lift each other up and to be there for each other whenever we are needed. Balancing discipline with mercy. This is what James ends on. James calls us to recognize sin and forgive and welcome the sinner warmly. If we don't see and name sin as sin, we take sin too lightly. If we excuse some as something harmless or just a lifestyle choice, this denies the seriousness of sin and the responsibility that the sinner has for their choices. In his final words in this letter, James echoes the words of Paul as he offers the sternest warning at his command in Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. In doing so, James makes his point that we have to do everything in our power to help people turn from sin and live the lives God wants for them. If we don't do this, he says we miss the forgiving spirit, which is at the core of Jesus' ministry. We need both. We need to recognize sin and to forgive and welcome the sinner warmly. Prayer. Have you ever wondered why I sometimes ask the servant leaders, either some of them or all of them as a group, to pray for you? It's what James tells us to do here in verse 14. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. In verses 12 to 18, James focuses on prayer. Prayer when things aren't going well. Prayer for the sick. The prayer of confession within community and the prayer of the righteous. Prayer when things aren't going well, even when things are going really badly, when we have major problems, when times are tough, when we're going through major trials, little ones, when we are in these times of trouble, what is James's answer? It is to pray. Why? Well, not all adversity and difficulties are hard to bear. Accepting difficulties is quite frankly alien to our culture. We live in a social and cultural world in which a great premium is placed on the elimination of discomfort. A reminder of the infomercials for the massage reliever, the massage recliner, which at the touch of a button supposedly transports you to a place of comfort, at least in your mind. I'm sure you can think of many other examples of things we see advertised that, that are aimed at making life easier, of removing stress and pain. James reminds us that we are called to go against this particular grain and adopt a biblical understanding of trouble and adversity. And he says we need to understand that God uses adversity to help us learn to grow spiritually. A couple of weeks ago, Yvonne talked about Ian Foster and what he and the All Blacks are going through as they have the worst run in their history. I'm hoping that they can learn like Richie McCaw in the 2007 All Blacks did. Some of you will remember the wailing and gnashing of teeth that happened in New Zealand when the worst happened. All Blacks didn't make it past the quarterfinals of the Rugby World Cup for the first time ever. The captain on that day was Richie McCaw who learned from the adversity of that game to become one of our greatest all Black captains and the only man to captain his team to two successive World Cup victories. If Richie McCaw's mental toughness and decision-making grew as a result of what he went through and how he allowed others, coaches, mentors, family and friends to, to help him learn from what he went through, how much more can we grow spiritually with God as our mentor and coach? And how do we access God's help? One way, of course, is through prayer. Trouble, difficulty, adversity, it's all part of life. We will not and we cannot avoid it, but we can learn from it. We can become stronger. 
we can we can grow and the best way to do that is to talk to god in prayer prayer for the sick when you hear the word sick what do you think of most people i suggest think of being physically sick suffering from some illness or disease perhaps the common cold or maybe COVID, or lying in hospital having had a heart attack or a stroke perhaps that's why people usually only come to the minister or the leaders for prayer when they are physically sick if they come at all let's face it most times people only come for prayer when they are invited to many a minister has got into trouble because they didn't pray for someone who was sick even though they hadn't been told the person was sick it's like they expected the minister to be psychic or something or to get a special word from god which of course does happen from sometimes but here james is saying it's not the responsibility of the minister or church leaders to go to you and ask if they can pray for you it's up to you you see it's up to us to seek out the minister and leaders and ask them to anoint us with oil and pray for us of course that's not to say that ministers and leaders shouldn't go to people and ask but it is to say we have a responsibility to go to them and ask for prayer for any type of sickness you see james is talking about healing prayer the type of prayer that is in line with the healing ministry of jesus which is intended for every part of people emotional mental health spiritual as well as physical yes we should ask for prayer when we are physically sick but we should also ask for it when we are emotionally sick or when we are mentally unwell and when we are spiritually sick as well do you get the picture if we are sick in any way we should pray and we should ask for prayer we don't need to be embarrassed we don't need to think we're troubling the minister and leaders we don't think have to think that we're wasting their time because none of that is true you see praying for someone is one of the greatest privileges that god gives ministers and leaders in fact it's one of the greatest privileges that god gives to all of us as christians the privilege of praying for someone else so don't deny others that privilege ask for prayer when you need it whether that is for physical mental emotional or spiritual health and when we are the ones who are called to pray what should we do theologian richard foster lists four things that i think are helpful to know to do and to remember they aren't new ideas but they're worth remembering and worth noting first of all listen we must listen to god and allow our spirits to discern the holy spirit and what he is saying secondly boldness we must ask with boldness thirdly believe we must believe with all our heart foster calls us to be confident and to exercise the confident assurance in the faithfulness of god and fourthly thankfulness we must give thanks to god for his compassion and his mercy and there's a fifth thing to remember not everyone we pray for will be healed this side of heaven or in the way we want them to be healed but if we take step one if we listen to god and allow our spirits to discern the holy spirit we will be better placed to know what to pray for the challenge then is to pray that even when we know it's not what the person or their loved ones want to hear because you see that's part of the call god places on all who pray especially leaders to pray as he leads not as our heart leads and then to leave the rest to him and that is what is so powerful about the prayer of a person living right with god and why says james it is something to be reckoned with the prayer of a person living right with god or to put it another way of a righteous person is powerful because they have discerned god's leading and are praying in accordance with that leading 
Or to think of it another way, it's as if God is speaking directly into the person's life. Because he is. Isn't that powerful? If you know the person who is praying for you is so in tune with God that they are channeling God's very thoughts and desires, doesn't that, that make you feel confident that what you are hearing is God's will for your life? James ends his letter as he started it. Indeed, in the same way that he has written throughout the whole letter, it is crisp, to the point, sharp, even harsh and rigid. He doesn't pull his punches, but he tells it like it is. He speaks plainly so that we can all understand. He doesn't let us have the excuse that I can't do what he says because the words are too hard or the wording is too obscure. And from this chapter, what is it that he says we are to do? We're to prayerfully consider how best to use our money. To be patient as we await Jesus' return. He says, don't judge others. Be active in then as a Christian community. Care for each other. Lift each other up. Be there for each other when we are needed. Recognize sin. Forgive the person and welcome them warmly. And to pray and ask for prayer. Which of these is the one God is challenging you on today? And what are you going to do about it? Let's conclude this part of our time together by doing the last, praying for each other. And I encourage you to do two things. Quietly go to God in prayer. Put aside any distractions that are there in the room. Discern or find out what God is telling you. It may be something for you. He may be telling you that you need to come forward so that one of the servant leaders or Yvonne can pray for you. He may be telling you to quietly pray for someone else. He may be telling you to go and pray for someone else in the room. And secondly, whatever it is, do what God is telling you to do. Can I ask the servant leaders to make sure that you make yourselves available for prayer? Can I ask Yvonne and the servant leaders to make sure that you are near the front to enable yourselves to be available to pray for others? And Yvonne, when you feel the time is right, would you please pray for the people?